Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks million for everybody uh, in the room. And also I think there's a large amount of people online as well. Look, uh, Barry McMullen, the chair of the Energy, Environment and Climate Committee asked me to come here today and host this event. Um, my name is Adon Michael Lear and I'm head of hydrogen and energy storage for the ESB. Um, originally now we had uh, Dr. Ivan Goro from SNAM. Uh, you may notice that I don't have an Italian accent, so I'm not him, but uh, unfortunately he got sick last Friday and then he was joined by John O'Sullivan, who also got sick this morning. So look, Paul Cullen was the replacement for uh, Ivan there on Friday, and now he's replacing for John today. So he's doing um, he's doing two or three jobs today, okay? So look, I really appreciate it. I'm delighted, delighted as well to welcome Paul Cullen here today. So Paul Cullen is um, a manager of 35 years experience in the ESB. He's worked across the ESB in power generation and some of the more difficult jobs. He's worked in the electric iron, the customer solutions part of the business. Uh, and he spent the last 10 years in commercial and has some really interesting roles in the commercial side of the business. So look, uh, Paul is now the hydrogen business development manager for the ESB. Uh, and he has a special focus on the delivery of large scale energy storage. I'm not going to do Paul's presentation for him, which I have a habit of doing, but uh, I just want to say maybe on behalf maybe of the ESB and maybe and also the um, Energy, Environment and Climate Committee, I think energy storage is the missing ingredient in the energy transition. And I think without large scale energy storage or solving the storage problem, we will not get anywhere near decarbonization of Ireland or Europe. So that's why look, I'm really delighted for everybody who's come here today. And with that, I'll pass over to Paul. Just look, there will be questions. Uh, there's a Q&A in the Zoom. So please ask questions here at the very end. I will, I will monitor the questions. And thank you, Paul. Good evening, everybody. Um, as I'm 35 years a member of this great institution. Um, I've presented a couple of times here before. I'm my first time presenting on this. Unfortunately, I'm on my own. My colleague, Dr. John O'Sullivan, would have been here, unfortunately. Um, he would have been able to answer all the hard questions. So when the hard questions come later on, I give my best shot, but we'll see how that goes. So if the technology works now, and it doesn't. Click on the screen once. There we go. Okay, so offshore wind. The question is delivering Ireland's net zero future. Uh, question mark. So the dream is that we build all this offshore wind and other renewables. We feed it onto the grid. The grid goes out and hey presto, all of that supply exactly meets demand and we don't need any storage or we don't need any backup. That's the dream. The reality is something very different. The reality is any renewable generation will have a intermittent profile. That there, believe it or not, is one year's wind off the east coast of Ireland, representing a squash down into one year, in, into one single graph. As you can see, obviously there are times you get full load, full output of your, of your winter wind farm. There are, however, a number of days, a number of times, hours, that you get less than that, sometimes nothing at all. So if you're trying to match that wind, that generation profile, and if, you, if that's your wind off the east coast of Ireland, your west coast of Ireland is not going to be that different, your south coast of Ireland is not going to be not, not that different. So the difficulty is matching that profile with a profile of demand that in some cases you, you have very little control over. So the reality is that offshore wind on its own will not deliver the matching up of supply and demand going future. So that issue is an issue if you're looking at individual days, a couple of days in a row, if you have poor wind, how are you going to fit in the shortfall there? But also we have a significant seasonality challenge coming at us. So if you look at the bar here, this basically is a rough indication of your electricity demand over the year. Week on week, obviously it changes. It's not an exact profile in around sort of four or five gigawatts. But if you look at the heat demand, the heat demand is it's very, very different. The electricity demand is not significantly seasonal. The heat demand is hugely seasonal. So the heat demand at the peak could be three times the electricity demand in terms of, in terms of terawatt hours. Again, that's where we're at right now. However, if we jump forward to, let's say, 2040, 2050, when we have carried out electrification of our heat is a major challenge that we'll be looking at. So what happens then is, by then your electricity demand is pretty much the same, but when you load on top of that, your, your heat demand that has been electrified, even with the, the efficiency deliverables, 
you have a situation where again you have a huge peak of demand in this in the winter time a huge peak of demand in the winter time and in the summertime you basically have a trough so if if you design your system to meet demand that means you have massive surplus across the summer so as engineers that's not the way you do it you probably look at something like this so you design your system so that in the winter time you basically have at summertime you have surplus you use that surplus to charge your storage and the winter time you use that that surplus that you've stored to feed it back into the electricity sector so within the hydro team within ESB we fundamentally believe that the future is going to be much more than about renewables as Adon says we believe there are four pillars one pillar of course is renewables all the different types of renewables feeding into the system for that surplus you need to be able to convert that 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 surplus renewable electricity into a medium that you can store one of those mediums is hydrogen and a series of hydrogen derivatives once you have the capability to, to produce that hydrogen you then need to be able to store it and store it at what i call utility scale right there's tens of terawatts of storage required for the future but that's not enough you also need to be able to convert that hydrogen or ammonia or whatever that derivative is back into electricity right now as engineers they're all huge challenges if you look at what of that exists right now at the scale that we need none of it right hydrogen production electrolyzers they're probably in so the tens of megawatts right now we're going to need gigawatt scale storage at batteries we see later on battery storage electricity storage you're looking at you know, again gigawatt scale rather than terawatt scale and the capability to produce hydrogen to take hydrogen or ammonia or any of these derivatives and produce electricity from them a lot of work has currently been done on them but it's not existing right now they're all things that have been worked on in parallel by different engineering companies around the world to solve this equation ESB, we see our role across all four of those. We are working, we have projects developed in all four of these and I'll cover off some of them now. So storage, what is storage? Okay, so go back a couple of years ago and look at what storage, what energy storage did we have in Ireland? We had Thurlock Hill, about a couple of hundred megawatts, a couple of hours a day, right? It, it'll only give a percentage of what the, what the energy system would need in a day. Batteries, if you take it, there might be a thousand megawatts of batteries right now. It's again, it's still only a tiny percentage of what the electricity sector needs in one day. Okay. Irish gas fields. The gas fields of themselves were de facto a store, right? So you had Kinsale, which is now closed. You have Carb, which is being depleted right now. And then the rest of our gas comes from the UK, where they don't have significant amount of storage. And I have some numbers on that later on. In Money Point, we have coal in the coal yard, typically about three months of coal in the coal yard. That was a significant storage regi regime that we had to supply the strategic store to Ireland should it so need. All of our gas plants um, around the country, they all have a store of diesel. It's required, it's had three days or five days, depending on the running regime of the plant. In Tarbert and the oil, oil, oil plants, typically have a number of weeks of storage, all right? And then the peat stations, typically in the peat stations that I was involved in there for a number of years, you roughly had about a year, year and a half supply of peat stored on the bogs. That's what we had up with now. But jump forward to 2040 plus, when we're in decarbonized, when we're not, we're not, we're not using any carbon, what have you got? That's what you have. All those other carbon-based storage are gone. And what you're left with is, is Turok Hill, a pump storage system, and you look at batteries. Now within batteries, of course, the amount of batteries are going much larger than what they have today. But in gigawatt scale batteries, right, you're still looking at less than one day's storage. One day's storage in batteries would, would roughly about the same size of your average county in Ireland right now, if you wanted to have just one day storage, never mind the 90 day storage that indicative wise Europe would like to see us having of, of any of our energy sources. So the alternative basically is we have to have large scale storage of energy, right? And like what we had here before, that large scale storage has to be diversified in, and uh, has to be in scale. So what does that mean? So if you look at the technologies, most of you would have seen the left-hand side part of before, I'd say. You're looking at the technology scale there. Now, that, this is a log scale. So across the bottom, you have the storage, and then the, uh, that vertical, you have the time. Flywheels, 
batteries, compressed air, pump storage. But if you put them on a straightforward scale, right, all of those technologies on the left-hand side or in the bottom corner, if you want to get roughly 10 terawatt hours of storage, which is our view in ESB of the minimum amount of storage we will have to have when we get to net zero, only hydrogen or a hydrogen derivative will deliver that scale of storage for you. ESB have put together a consortium working with us to develop storage. That consortium is made of a company called DecarbonX, who are experts and have a lot of expertise from the oil and gas exploration industry. They're part owned by SNAM. SNAM is currently the biggest natural gas distributor and storage and operating storage fields of gas in Europe. They're an Italian based company. But like ourselves, they're looking out to 2040, 2045 and saying, well, look, if they don't change their business model, to this new world, they're going to be left behind. So they are actually doing an awful lot right now, both upstream and downstream, investing in hydrogen and hydrogen storage and hydrogen, hydrogen capabilities. And it's great for us to have them involved with us as we go forward. So underground storage. Um, so there are essentially three types of underground storage right now. You have depleted gas fields, and we're involved in that looking at, at Kinsale gas field. You have salt caverns, and then you have saline aquifers are the three mains. I'm not sure if Ireland has saline aquifers, but certainly depleted gas with the salt caverns are part of what we're working on and developing in ESB. If you look at storage quantities across Europe, um, the storage quantities across Europe, typically in terms of the amount of storage gas, the underground storage that they hold, right? They, most countries in Europe would comply with EU's indicate of 90 days of storage. It's sort of a benchmark that all countries would, 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 would run to. So in Italy, in Germany, in Ukraine, you know, they all have significant quantities of underground gas storage. The UK has very little. Ireland has none. We have derogations because we're linked to the UK, but in terms of long-term moving forward, we need to address that within Ireland. So at ESB, in this consortium, we have a number of areas we're looking at. Kestrel, which I'll talk about in the next few slides. Kestrel is where we're looking at the Kinsale head and using the Kinsale gas field for storage of natural gas initially, progress to hydrogen storage. The Quiche Basin off the, off the Dublin coast, we're looking at developing salt caverns at the Quiche Basin. Green Atlantic at Money Point you may have heard about, right, which is about the whole, you know, capturing of all the offshore wind or elements of the offshore wind off the west coast of Ireland. Our view there is we will be looking at hydrogen or possibly ammonia as the storage regime for there, because we don't have readily access to the underground storage capabilities that you will need for large scale utility scale hydrogen storage. We also are looking at the onshore storage in the UK. And one of my colleagues is working again with DecarbonX and STAM, looking at potential for, off for onshore storage in the UK. So salt cavern storage, again, it's a term I'd heard about um, for a while now. Wasn't exactly sure what is it? What does it give you? What size is it? So a typical salt cavern is roughly about 120 diameters and 260 meters. And what I just said in my college, think of Crow Park standing on its end, way down below the ground where there is salt. That's the easy way to visualize it. Each one of those salt caverns would typically hold 225 gigawatt hours, again, roughly depending on the size. If we want to achieve our 10 terawatt hours of storage in salt caverns, you need 45 of those caverns. There is a very good video that I'm going to show you. The video itself is nothing to do with our project. It was a video that was developed a number of years ago from a gateway project in the UK. It was about salt cavern de development, primarily for natural gas storage. But it was a very good video in terms of giving an, people an idea of what gas, what salt cavern storage is and what's involved in it. So I'm just going to play the video for you. And just before going on to that, recent SAI sponsored uh, funded research has indicated that yes, we do have significant volumes of salt, potential salt cavern development off the east coast of Ireland. And this works hopefully. The Gateway Gas Storage Project is an underground natural gas storage facility in the East Irish Sea. Operational controls will be located on shore at Barrow in Furness in northwest England, next to an existing gas terminal. Storage caverns will be developed in a salt structure below the seabed. 
allowing gas to be delivered, stored and then returned to the UK's national transmission system. Gas pipelines, a power cable and fiber optic control lines stretch 24 kilometers, connecting gateways onshore and offshore facilities. The pipelines are connected to a manifold platform for controlling the flow of gas to each cavern. Power cable and control lines are connected to a distribution platform for onward transmission to hub and satellite platforms located above each cavern. They support the equipment necessary for both the construction and operation of the caverns. The 20 salt caverns are created in a thick salt bed. The site has been carefully selected to enable large caverns to be constructed and operated with high standards of safety. Gas is injected into the caverns when consumer demand is low and withdrawn from caverns when consumer demand is high. Construction begins with offshore platforms being lifted onto pre-installed piles. Pipelines, cables and control lines are then connected to the platforms. Caverns are created by injecting seawater down one well and returning the dissolved salt through a second well in the same cavern. This process takes two to three years to complete. When the cavern has been constructed, water remaining in the cavern is removed by injecting gas. The cavern is then ready for operation. Gas is withdrawn and piped to shore for distribution during periods of high demand and stored during periods of low gas usage. The Gateway project will increase UK gas storage capacity by 30%. Okay, so one of the key things in there is, I mean, obviously the size of the storage, it's, 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 it's quite large, but from my last slide, you're gonna need a lot of them to deliver the potential for 10 terawatt hours. And you may have caught that the actual time to you know, carve out one of those is about two to three years each. And if we needed 45 on them, Let's say you have the technology in place that could do two or three at a time. You're still talking a long time before you're the 45. Um, as I said already, we believe 10 terawatt hours plus is what's needed. Yes, some of that will be delivered by salt caverns. We believe some of it can be delivered by ammonia storage on the West Coast in particular, but that's not going to be enough in itself. So that's why we fundamentally believe that the, the concealed gas field needs to be utilized as part of the storage regime going forward. Bordolano is, so again, this is where my Italian colleague was gonna come in. So Bordolano is one of a number of gas storage facilities that they have in Italy run by SNAM. I think they have 10 plus facilities in total. Um, it's the most recent. Um, in terms of the size, my, some of my colleagues on the geology side of things on the oil and gas, they like to talk about BCM. The BCM is a billion cubic meters of equivalent gas at, nat at natural pressure. So in my head, I like to convert those figures into terawatt hours, which is more what, what I can understand. So the capacity of Bordolano was 1.2 BCM, which is 12 terawatt hours of storage of natural gas equivalent. Um, and it can deliver about 20 million cubic meters per day, which is roughly about 200 gigawatt hours per day. So 200 gigawatt hours is roughly about 4,000 megawatts, enough gas to supply 4,000 megawatts of electricity generation per day. Or if you look at the 1.2 billion cubic meters, it's about 4,000 megawatts steady for about 60 days. That's roughly the size of the amount of gas that is stored there. Okay, so it basically from the field, I say the concept started in 2013. That's when they got their go the green light. They started production construction in 2014 and started operation in 2016. So it was a three-year development. 
So the gas field itself is onshore, uh, but essentially all of that kit that's there is what we will have to build in order to you know, bring Kinsale back into operation. Um, they have nine well, well heads themselves, tied to market three years, and it's fully operated by remote from their head, head, headquarters. I have a video now about Bartolano and the construction of it. And again, I'll take you through that. As you can see, a massive engineering project to put that in place. Um, the site itself is roughly about 10 hectares. In terms of how it operates, and they operate all their storage like this in the UK or in, in Italy and across most of Europe. Essentially, once the winter is over, they start to fill that up and the filling process takes right the whole way up. And they target to have it absolutely full um, by, the, by the start of September, typically. And then they, as, as the demand for gas fills up or increases, then they start drawing out. What they aim to is that they have eight injection points into Italy for gas, and they try to basically keep the level of gas coming into the country steady right across the year. In the summertime, like our graph at the start, of it, in the electricity, I think, like our, so basically in the summertime where the demand is lower for gas, they're filling up their storage, and the wintertime, then they're using the surplus to feed back. So Southwest Kinsale, um, so the Kinsale gas field itself, the Kinsale had a number of fields. You can see Ballycotton um, on the left-hand side there, on the right-hand side graph, you have Ballycotton, you have the Kinsale gas field itself, and within the Kinsale, there was a gas field on the southwest corner, what they called Southwest Kinsale field. That was discovered by Marathon in 1995. It started production from there in 1999. And in the year 2000, they basically had most of the operational gas removed from it. At that stage, they actually converted that gas field, that Southwest can gas, can sale gas field, to essentially a seasonal storage. So what they done essentially is they kept their production from Kinsale at the same level, same idea. Even though there was no production gas left in Kinsale, they actually basically pumped the gas in the summertime into Kinsale, into Southwest Kinsale field, and then in the winter time, then when prices were higher and demand was higher, then they took it back. So the Southwest Kinsale gas field was used for the storage of natural gas from 2000 up to about 2016, at which, case, at which stage the gas field set in Kinsale was starting to wind down and they stopped using the storage and basically took all the, the operation gas back out of it. There is still some of what's called cushion gas still left in that field. Recent research by, by UCD indicates that in total, potentially across the whole gas field, including the massive gas field itself, can sail, can sail field is about 67 terawatts, but there are massive challenges involved in, that, in operating that size of a storage regime. Kestrel. So basically at Kestrel, what we visit is bringing the can sail gas field back into operation. 
initially for the storage of natural gas, and then progressing as we get hydrogen on stream, progressing it over a number of years to be in full hydrogen storage. If you look down through the actual cross section, obviously the sea, you've got called cap rock, and then the gas field itself, you're working gas and cushion gas. Kestrel enables the Irish energy transition. So key Irish needs for a transition path. We need large scale storage of natural gas now, right? Natural gas, we need that storage now. But we need to do it in such a way that that natural gas storage can transition to hydrogen when hydrogen comes on stream. We need to develop that in a, in a, in a planned approach to that energy transition. That means optimizing the use of existing assets, such as Kinsale. It means not investing huge money right now in plant and equipment that can get stranded. It means interchanging the gas and the electricity sector. The two of those sectors need to work together going forward. Kestrel, we believe, delivers that to the Irish energy sector. We can deliver a secure energy system driven by renewables and green hydrogen through Kestrel. So what's involved? So on the left-hand side, essentially, is the different things that we have to do. So right now, you may be aware, you may not be aware, the Kinsale gas field has been decommissioned. The pipeline out to the Kinsale field has been flooded with seawater. Inch strand where the gas came in has been completely dismantled. Out at sea, there were two platforms, Alpha and Bravo. They were dismantled last summer. And the wellheads themselves have been what's called plugged and abandoned, which basically means the pipe, steel pipe has been pulled up and the top of the well itself has been, has been capped. So for all intents and purposes, it's put beyond use. Now that doesn't mean it can't be brought in back into use, and that's essentially what we're looking at. We have on our team, the guys from SNAM, some of them were actually involved extensively in that project over its life, particularly the, when it was being used for storage. So what needs to happen is, is if we start on the onshore side of things, we need to construct all of what we saw at Bordelano. We need to construct the compression, the capability to, to, to get natural gas initially, and then hydrogen out to the gas field. We are currently looking at where the optimum tie-in point is. It's likely we may not use inch. We might look at some other options, possibly into at a power station itself as, as the pipeline route. Okay. The pipeline itself is say it's flooded, it's 40 years old. We need to look at the technical integrity of that pipeline to whether, whether we will actually reuse the pipeline or alternatively run what's called pipe in pipe or alternatively use that route to run a new pipeline out along that road. It's part of what we're looking at right now. Um, so then out at the gas field itself. So we're primarily if we focus on South, on Southwest Kinsale, which is because we know that that is capable and it was very, very good at storage of, of natural gas. That's our initial primary focus. We would be drilling wellheads, new wellheads there. Those wellheads will be hydrogen enabled. So they will be sized such that the volume of hydrogen we need to get in and out of that gas field, eventually when we move to full hydrogen, it will be able to move that amount of gas, but in hydrogen, both in and out of the gas field at the time to come. Um, and then, so that we expect there will probably be a much bigger number than the three that was currently, that was there used in the past. We will be, basically, we're not putting in platforms, everything will be subsea, there'll be sub subsea manifold to distribute the gas from a single pipeline out to the various wellheads. And we are currently, along with SNAM, doing a lot of research into the capability of, of those, of that, that gas field. In terms of the volume of potentially the volume of gas that it can store. When it was used before, it was roughly about 2.1 terawatt hours of storage. We believe that can at full capacity run up about seven terawatt hours of storage. Okay. There are other things we're also looking at in terms of the capability of it in terms of the storage of hydrogen. So you're looking at the potential for it to actually make sure the hydrogen doesn't escape. You're looking at the potential for microbi microbiological interaction with, with hydrogen to actually, could actually contaminate the hydrogen cell. You're looking at the geophysical aspects of the, of the gas field and other such challenges. SNAM, again, as I said at the start, they have huge expertise in this. They are the largest company that's in this game in Europe right now. They have already started a lot of work on the technical capability of, sub, of, of depleted gas fields to store hydrogen. They believe in the research they've done so far that on desktop that it can be done. 
They have technology in a laboratory in a university for actually testing core samples taken from a gas field, kept at the temperature and pressure that is at in the gas field, long period of time looking, injecting hydrogen into that. The results so far have been very positive. The next step in their challenge is, is, to, be actually, is to actually inject hydrogen into an existing gas field and look to see how does that hydrogen perform. That's part of what they're currently planning right now. Um, I said, we are looking at Southwest Kinsale, that's what seven terawatt hours, which roughly is, would be enough capacity to run the ESP's Ahada plant and the BGE plant there for about 140, day, 140 days in total, should it be called upon as natural gas. We are also looking at Ballycotton, which is the other gas field that's down there just to the north of it. Roughly similar in capacity is what we're looking at there. From a CapEx side of things, we're estimating about 500 million euros as the cost, half a billion as the cost. And then you have what's called cushion gas to purchase, depending on the quantity of it and depending on the price of gas at the time. So that's an amount of gas that basically you, you don't essentially withdraw until the end, if you ever come to the end, that basically maintains the pressure in the field. So when you inject more gas into what we call operation gas, you inject that in and it basically keeps the pressure there. So it, it's, it's there to force it back out again. So this next slide then looks at, okay, there has been a lot of talk about FSRUs, about LNG terminals. And this is something we put together as part of the consultation process back in November. We're working with SNAM who, who basically have all this technology. SNAM have, um, subs, they have natural gas storage in, in depleted gas fields. They have FSRUs, they have LNG terminals. So a lot of this data came from them in terms of comparison of the three of those technologies, particularly in relation at the storage challenge, right? I'll summarize at the end, but we believe that FSRU and LNGs are not storage solutions. They are diversity solutions. They're diversity to give you different channels of, of gas into the country. From this typical size, Kestrel basically with Ballycotton and Southwest Conceal will give us 15 terawatt hours of storage of natural gas. An FRSU contains roughly about one terawatt hour. Okay. An LNG terminal, depending on the number of, of tanks that you build, typically about three, so that's three, term, three terawatt hours. So what does that mean in Ireland's energy demand? So 15 terawatt hours is roughly 90 days of Ireland's current demand, if you look at it average over the year. One terawatt hour is seven days that an FSU can deliver. An LNG terminal can deliver about 21. So again, you know, is that storage or is it really just you know, a, a transportation mechanism? In terms of the carbon footprint, Kestrel storage of compressed natural gas, low carbon footprint. However, if you actually use an FS or an LNG, you're talking about liquefied natural gas. LNG is about 100, minus 160 degrees Celsius and there's very feature what's called boil off. An LNG storage device typically boils off at 0.2% of its capacity every day. So after, after a year, you've lost 70% of your capacity of that tank. Now, if you're filling that tank back up again, is it going to be feasible to get a delivery of half a tanker load to fill it back up again? Probably not. In addition, the actual energy required to compress, to liquefy that gas is high. It's 10% plus of the energy. So that means every year, if you just had that sitting there as a storage and not using it for anything else, Every year, you're going to have to put in 10% of the energy just to keep it there, to compensate for the boil off. This figures from, from SNAM, I'm not from SNAM, so I can't stand over them, but we have critiqued them, they've explained where they got them from. So their, their long-term cost of storage, um, they would view from their experience, there's a significant difference in the cost of, of depleted gas field storage being 10 to 15 per terawatt hour, compared to 40 to 70 or 30 to 65 for an FSRU or LNG terminal. In terms of the capex per terawatt hour of storage, as you can see, there's a significant difference. We would reckon can sell somewhere in that 30, 50 to 150, probably midpoint about 100, compared to an FSRU for per terawatt hour of storage, four, 300 to 400 million. And then an LNG terminal, again, a similar amount, even though you have more storage delivered in, in an LNG terminal itself. Are they hydrogen ready? Very simply, no. Yes, for Kestrel, but we have to do more research. And you know, that's part of what we've been doing before we decide to invest. Our view in ESP, we'll be only doing this as a, as a hydrogen store. However, if you look at FSU and LNG terminal, 
LNG is minus 162 degrees, right? All the technology is, is designed in there to operate at that temperature. If you would were to convert that in theory to hydrogen, liquid hydrogen is minus 263 degrees, I think it is. Um, the technology is not compatible. You cannot basically take an LNG terminal, you cannot take a FSRU and say, yeah, I'm going to convert that tomorrow morning. There's massive challenge in terms of metallurgy. There's massive challenge in terms of the temperatures, the actual equipment that you need to, to operate it, the, the pipelines and all that, completely different technology, completely different metallurgy required. Years of operation, you know, underground storage was there, there for 40 years. The Italians were operated for that length of time, plus FRSUs and LNG terminals, they're taking a piece of kit, typically 20 to 30 years in, in, in lifespan. Just watch my time. Um, visual impact, again, LNG, LNG terminals, FRSUs, they're, they're big beasts, they're typically on your coastline. Um, I'd say most people here, even if they lived in Cork, weren't aware that underground sto gas storage was used in Kest in out in Kinsale for 15 years. It's not visible. Okay. Um, in terms of the historical use of it, Kinsale Field is tried and tested. It has been used already significantly for gas storage, right? And equally, FSUs and LNG terms are not here to say that's not the case. I mean, a lot of countries are developing that technology, they're implementing that technology. All the countries already have significant gas storage already. They are using that technology, not so much for storage, they're using that technology to give them another channel for getting gas into the country. Now the pipelines from Russia are no longer available to them. So lastly, in summary, strategic supply of, of, of strategic security supply, we believe Kestrel will deliver that. We also fundamentally believe that that cannot be delivered by FSRUs or LNG terminals. So where does it all fit in? So solely just building Kestrel and operating it is only part of, go back to what I said at the start in terms of the four pillars, generation, production, storage, and, and generation electricity from that. So this is where we see it fit in, okay? So offshore at Cork, we will have Kestrel. We also have significant wind, gener will have gen wind generation, be that ESPs or maybe somebody else's, but you will have significant offshore generation coming into Cork. That may not be generation that's going on to the bars. Some of that generation may be coming straight down on shore for the manufacture of, for the production of hydrogen. So in our, in our vision, the pipeline, the gas pipeline and the electricity is coming in ashore is coming into Ahada. At Ahada, we are, we are producing hydrogen. The hydrogen has not been used in the locality. I'll come on to the second, will be pumped back out to Kestrel. Initially, we will be taking back a blend. When the wind doesn't blow and the system needs production, we'll be taking back a blend, burning that blend in our gas turbines, in BGE's gas turbines, both of which can operate up to put 40% by volume of, of, natural, of hydrogen in the natural gas. In the long term, that generation technology will have to transition to pure hydrogen burning technology. That's not ready now. I said that at the start, but that's what will be there. And that's, that's where this fits into the big picture. It's not just about that particular part of it, about, about storing the energy, bringing it back, being able to produce. We're also looking at, the, at, at Cork, as we call a cluster or a hydrogen valley. ESB is significantly involved in Hynet over in Manchester, where we have one of our, the biggest power plants, most modern power plants in the UK, gas fire product, Carrington, sits outside Manchester. It's part of the Hynet project, which has a lot of industries involved. And within their cluster, the power station in Carrington will be transitioning to the burning of gas, burning of hydrogen. But part of the cluster is storage, part of the cluster is feeding hydrogen to local industries. We see that very much for Cork as well. We're already you know, talking to a lot of the industries down in Cork. So if you look at it, you have obviously you have BGE in, in, in their power plant. You have the Irvine oil refinery, potential there for, for conversion of hydrogen into a lot of other e-fuels and such. You have the pharmaceutical sector across the bay. We've already started discussion with pharmaceutical about, well, look at it, you, know, you have a heat demand. As part of your decarbonization, would you be interested in converting that heat demand to hydrogen as a source of energy? You also have transportation. Um, a lot of, you know, between the, the bus transportation, heavy duty trucks, they're recently out of Europe, they're saying, listen, you, you need to have hydrogen, a refueling hydrogen station every 200 kilometers along the system. One of them will be in Cork we can potentially supply hydrogen to that facility. 
We can also supply hydrogen to the shipping industry in the, in, in the port of Cork. And lastly, there is a potential to grow a whole new hydrogen enabled industry in the Cork region because we will have a ready supply of hydrogen for them in the in Cork region. That's me.